The President. Members, it's question time. Are there any questions? President. Okay, thank you, members. The Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, President. And my question without notice, and welcome to Thursday. My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, uh, is to the Minister for Mental Health representing the Treasurer. I refer to the GST received by the State of Western Australia and the flaw instigated by the Morrison government, and I ask one, what indication or evidence has the government received that the Commonwealth Government is considering altering the GST agreement struck with this state to implement the current flaw in GST payments? Two, has the government received any correspondence from the Commonwealth Government in regard to their position on the current GST floor agreement? Three, please table that correspondence. Four, what evidence does the Treasurer have that the Commonwealth has any intention of changing the GST agreement? And five, please table that evidence. The Minister for Mental Health. Thank you, President, and I thank the Leader of the Opposition for some notice of the question. One, the Commonwealth has been under sustained pressure from other states and territories to undo the GST reforms. For example, the South Australian and Victorian Treasurers have raised their concerns with the GST reforms in recent months. Two, the Prime Minister and Federal Treasurer have only provided verbal assurances of their intention to not unwind the GST reforms. The State Government would welcome the Honourable Member's support in seeking formal assurance from his uh, Commonwealth counterparts, three to five, C one to two. The Leader of the Opposition. President. Uh, my question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for Mental Health representing the Treasurer. Uh, I refer to the 2018-19 to 2020-21 boom in iron ore royalties, and I ask one, what is the current spot price of iron ore as measured by Treasury? Two, does the Treasurer receive a nightly update on iron ore price from Treasury to help him sleep, as the previous Treasurer publicly acknowledged? <laughs> Three, what is the total government royalty revenue to date for the 2021 financial year? And four, is an iron ore spot price above US $150 a tonne for the rest of 2021 highly unrealistic? The Minister for Mental Health. Thank you, President. And again, I thank the Leader of the Opposition for some notes to the question. One, uh, US $191.3. Two, the Treasurer receives an overnight update of the iron ore spot price. Three, as stated in the answer to Legislative Council question without notice number two, on 29 April 2021, iron ore royalty income totaled $5.129 billion to 31 December 2020, as shown in the latest December quarterly report. The actual for 2020-2021 will be published published in the annual report on state finances in September 2021. Four, as stated in the answer to Legislative Council question without notice number two on 29 April 2021, annual average prices are shown in the annual report on state finances published each financial year. Iron ore prices are highly volatile. The McGowan Labor government's budgets are based on a prudent iron ore methodology given this inherent volatility. The Honourable Colin de Grusser. Thank you, uh, President. My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health. I refer to question C147 asked in this place on the 25th of May 2021, and I ask one, will you table all presentations, reports, data and correspondence regarding concerns and issues raised by the Emergency Department of Perth Children's Hospital to the Executive of the Child and Adolescent Health Service for the period 1 October 2020 inclusive to 30 April 2021 inclusive, including but not limited to information identified in the SAC-1 Clinical Incident Investigation Report, contributing factors and root causes into Ashwarya Aswas death, and two, if no, to one, why not? Minister for Mental Health. Thanks very much, uh, President, and I thank the Deputy Leader of the Opposition for some notice of the question. One, no. Two, an independent inquiry will, will be conducted into the Child and Adolescent Health Service in respect of all the functions and operations of Perth Children's Hospital concerning the care of Ashwarya As Aswath. Uh, as part of the terms of reference, the inquiry will investigate the roles and responsibility of responsibilities of clinicians, management and the executive at PCH and their escalation of issues to the Child and Adolescent Health Service Board. The Honourable Jorn Sidmer. Thank you, uh, President. My question without notice, of which some notice is given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Environment. I refer to the explanatory memorandum for the Conservation and Land Management Amendment Bill 2021, 
which identifies that the proposed amendments will, among other things, provide for the laudable aim of, and I quote, greater recognition of the rights of Aboriginal people by broadening the purpose of marine parks to include the protection and conservation of the value of marine parks to the culture and heritage of Aboriginal people. And I ask, one, does the continuation of lawful commercial and recreational activities prevent or impede the protection of Aboriginal culture and heritage in marine parks, marine management areas and or marine nature reserves? And two, if yes to one, can the Minister provide specific examples? Minister for Mental Health. Thank you, President. I'm earning my money this afternoon. Uh, I provide the following answer on behalf of the Minister for Environment. One to two, such matters would be considered on a case-by-case -case basis through the preparation or revision of the management plan for the respective marine reserve under the Conservation and Land Management Act of 1984. The Honourable Nick Guerin. Thank you, President. Uh, my question, without notice of which some notice has been given, is to the Parliamentary Secretary representing the Attorney General. I refer to your answer to question without notice number 973, answered on the 5th of September 2019 in the 40th Parliament, in which you informed the House of your commitment to table a review into the efficiency and effectiveness of the commencement and conduct of prosecutions arising from Corruption and Crime Commission investigations by the 20th of September. 2019, and I ask one, on what date was the review report completed, and two, on what date was the report tabled? Uh, the Parliamentary Secretary to the Attorney General. Thank you, President, and I thank the member for some notice of the question. I provide the following answer on behalf of the Attorney General: one, May 2020; two, not applicable. The Honourable Donna Farragher. The Honourable Donna Farragher has the call. Uh, thank you. Oh, President. Uh, President, my question without notice of which some notice has been given is to the Minister for Education. I refer to the new $1.2 million program to be trialled at two Perth schools to support children and families who speak English as an additional language before they start school. And I ask, one, has the trial commenced? And if so, what is its total duration? Two, can the Minister provide more information about the program, including a breakdown of how the $1.2 million is to be spent? And three, will an evaluation of the program be conducted at the completion of the trial? Uh, the Leader of the House. Thanks, uh, President. I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. One, the trial will commence in semester two, 2021, and continue until the end of 2024. Two, the program will be trialled at Bentley and Maylands Peninsula Primary Schools. It is designed to help the children of families from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds to successfully transition to school. The breakdown of how the $1.2 million is to be spent is $904,000 on salaries, early childhood trained teacher and an ethnic assistant, $240,000. $43,500 school startup and program delivery, $53,000 project support and startup, $1,500 staff training and development. Three yes. The Honourable Peter Collier. Uh, thank you, President. My question without notice, which some is given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Police. One, will the Minister confirm that the Mental Health Co Response Unit consists of four teams of nine uh, police officers as well as the authorised mental health practitioners sourced from local health providers? Two, if no to one, will the Minister provide the exact composition of Mental Health Co Response Unit? Three, have any officers been moved from any of the four teams over the past 12 months? And four, if yes to three, which of the four teams and how many officers have been removed? Minister for Mental Health. Thank you very much, President, and I thank the Honourable Member for some notes of the question. The following answer has been provided to me by the Minister for Police. The McGowan Government is recruiting 950 additional police officers, or 15 per cent more officers, the largest single increase in police numbers in Western Australia's history. The McGowan Government has also committed to boosting funding by an estimated $20.2 million for the Mental Health Co-Response Program to expand the program to Bunbury and Geraldton and to provide more mental health teams in the metropolitan area. One to two, the Western Australia Police Force advise yes. The authorised mental health practitioners are provided by the Department of Health. Three to four, deployment decisions are made by the Commissioner of Police. The WA Police Force advise that in the last 12 months during the state of emergency, several officers have been temporarily deployed to Operation Tide in response to the COVID-19 pandemic and to the Perth Watch House. Further, to accommodate the temporary, temporary deployments, some staff from the Cannington team have also been temporarily redeployed to other teams without affecting the response in Cannington. The WA Police Force is on track to boost mental health co-response in the metropolitan and regional areas. The Hon. Wilson Tucker. Thank you, President. My question, without notice in which some notice has been given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Fire and Emergency Services. I refer the Minister to an article published in today's edition of The Countryman, which reports on the traffic management and operation of roadblocks during the Wurraloo bushfires in February this year. I note the article paraphrases one resident as describing the roadblock experience as more stressful than the fire. 
Given the January 2016 Waruna Fire Special Inquiry explicitly recommended a review of the policy for traffic management at emergency incidents to reflect national best practice, can the Minister provide an update on the status of this much needed review? Leader of the House. Uh, thanks, uh, President. I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. A working group was convened on the um, 2nd of September 2016 to consider recommendation 14 of the January 2016 Waruna Fire Special Inquiry to review the policy for traffic management at emergency incidents. The working group revisited the policy and guidelines in view of the Ferguson findings. The group concluded that the existing policy did not require amendment, but did identify the need to improve implementation and communication of the processes, including the newly developed Department of Fire and Emergency Services Restricted Access Permit System. The working group oversaw the development of an aid memoir for use by personnel at the vehicle checkpoints, a checklist describing the establishment and operation of the traffic management planning function for use by the incident management team, and implementation of the fire and emergency services restricted access permit system, including education and information for the community and first responders. The Honourable Sophia Mormont. My question, without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for Regional Development, Agriculture and Food. I refer the Minister to the Regional Dry Crop Agronomy Seed Cultivar Trials and Harvest Survey overseen by HempGrow and financed by government funding in the financial year 2018-19, to and I ask, one, does the government intend to release the findings of the trials and or survey, or does it have a timetable for the release of that information by any third parties? Two, were any similar trials or studies undertaken or completed since 2018 and 19? And if so, what plans, if any, are there to release that information? Three, are there any plans to continue such research into the future? And is the minister able to share those plans with the House? The Minister for Regional Development. Um, I thank the uh, member for the question. Uh, member, yesterday I did provide information about uh, the trials that we are currently doing. So uh, the answer to that part of the question obviously is yes, as per uh, the question that we provided yesterday. In relation to those um, particular um, studies that were done under the auspices of HempGrow, um, we, um, I'm advised that uh, this uh, information has all available results to date in this research area have been given in um, numerous forums, including open forums of growers in April 2021. Um, an Emerging Industries Food Conference in Darwin, May 2021. Interviews in regional ABC re results were presented on all hemp trials at a conference in Fremantle in February 2000, and no, it says 2020, and a symposium in March 2021. Um, both events in Fremantle covered media, media coverage. But remember, I do think that this sort of information uh, should be placed um, on the uh, website so that it is um, uh, properly available. So I have uh, today asked um, DPIRD uh, to make sure um, that they put these, uh, collate these reports and that that material will be, um, uh, will be online, it will be available on the website. Um, of obviously the work that I referred to yesterday, the 2021 work um, is still underway, but we will certainly be um, presenting that at the March 2020 um, uh, third biennial Australian Industrial um, uh, Hemp Conference. The Honourable Brian Walker. Thank you, President. Uh, my question, without notice of which some notice has been given, is to the Parliamentary Secretary to the Attorney General. I refer the Parliamentary Secretary to the review of the Criminal Property Confiscation Act undertaken by the Honourable Wayne Martin, which concluded two years ago almost to the day and was tabled without comment in the other place in December 2019. Acknowledging the many other legislative reforms currently in the pipeline, I nonetheless ask, what timetable, if any, is the Attorney General working to in terms of a formal response to the review, either in whole or in part? And when might we reasonably expect to see something tabled here or in the other place? 
the Parliamentary Secretary to the Attorney General. Thank you, President, and I thank the member for some notice of the question, and the following answer is provided on behalf of the Attorney General. As the member rightly points out, the government has a considerable legislative agenda. Additionally, for much of last year, significant resources in the Department of Justice were redirected to the COVID-19 pandemic response. The Martin Review made more than 60 recommendations canvassing both legislative and administrative matters, with the primary recommendation being that the government give consideration to repealing and replacing the Act in its entirety. The recommendations of the Martin Review remain under detailed consideration by the government, noting that criminal property confiscation scheme is complex and any reform, should it be pursued, would be a large body of work. The Honourable Martin Aldrich. Uh, thank you, President. My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for Trans uh, Minister representing the Minister for Transport. I refer to the extension of the Tonkin Highway referred to as the Northlink project and ask one. Since the project was opened to traffic, how many claims of compensation has Main Roads or its contractors received relating to damage caused by loose surface material? Two, how many claims have been settled and what is the total value of compensation payments to date? Three, how many noise complaints have been received to date? Four, has the results of the noise monitoring survey that was undertaken at the end of August 2020 been publicly, re publicly released as the Minister committed to in answer to Legislative Council question without notice 1211? And five, if yes to four, please table the report. If not, why not? The Leader of the House. Thanks, President. I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. Uh, one, 1,724. Two, 1,457 claims have been resolved, 964 claims have been paid, totalling $947,261. Three, 43, four and five, results of the noise monitoring survey have been provided to the residents who lodged noise complaints, and uh, uh, we will table the report. Uh, this says tomorrow. Now, this question was lodged on the 25th of May, so I'm going which is what this answer says. Right. So, yeah. Okay, so we're all good then. We're on the same page. Okay. Thanks, President. Uh, thank you. Can we, uh, the Honourable James Haywood. Uh, thank you, uh, President. Uh, my question, uh, without notice, to which some notice has been given, is to the Leader of the House, representing the Minister for Housing. I refer, refer to the end of the rental moratorium on the 28th of March, and I ask, one, how many eviction notices have there been from public housing? Two, Further to one, how many people or families have been evicted into homelessness from public housing? Three, is the minister aware that a family of five children is one of 159 families in the magistrate's court over the last two days facing tenancy, he uh, tenancy hearings and evictions? And how many homes has the government spot purchased in advance of the moratorium lifting? Four, is the minister aware uh, the by name homeless count for Perth, Fremantle and surrounds increased by 58 per cent since November 2021. Uh, can the minister uh, name, sorry, I'm not sure that November must be 2020. Um, can the minister name uh, any programs currently in place to direct, uh, directly increase the supply of affordable rental properties? The Leader of the House. Uh, President, uh, I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. Uh, one to two, since the 28th of March 2021, there have been zero evictions from public housing. Three to four, matters regarding the magistrate's court and the project should be referred to the Attorney General and the Minister for Community Services, respectively. Five, the McGowan government is investing nearly $1 billion in social and affordable housing programs and homeless support services programs, including the Social Housing Economic Recovery Package and the Housing and Homelessness Investment Package. In partnership with the Commonwealth Government, the WA Government is continuing to increase affordable rental supply through the National Rental Affordability Scheme, which stimulates new privately owned construction to be delivered for affordable rental purposes. <clears throat> Under the scheme, owners receive incentives to rent their property to eligible low to moderate income households for at least 20 per cent below market rate. Tax incentives from the Commonwealth and financial incentives from the state are provided in arrears for 10 years. The McGowan government's $20,000 building bonus grant is playing a critical role in the significant increase of new home building approvals in WA, with over 24,000 applications received as at 20th of May 2021. In the 12 months to March, there have been 23,100 new homes approved for construction, the largest growth on record. As new homes come online, supply-side pressures will begin to ease with more properties in the rental market. The Honourable Neil Thompson. 
Thank you, President. Uh, my question without notice, for which some notice is given, is to the Minister for Education. I refer to verbal reports by local leaders and school teachers that school attendance among Aboriginal children has dropped significantly since the uh, onset of the COVID crisis. Uh, concerns exist that this trend will exacerbate further disadvantage, and I ask is the Minister aware of uh, reports uh, of reduced school attendance? And two, what is the average <coughs> attendance rates of students in each year, cohort K to 12, in the following locations in the years 2016, 2019, 2020, and 2021? And uh, for the locations of Halls Creek, Fitzroy Crossing, Wyndham, Derby, and Kununurra. Leader of the House. Thanks, President. I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question one yet. Two, in 2020, the Kimberley region received additional funding to support the re-engagement of students. Attendance data for 2021 are not provided as the semester has not been completed. The Department of Education's data verification processes are not commenced until term three. Attendance data for 2016 to 2020 are provided for semester one each year in accordance with the national standards for student attendance data reporting. The data in 2019 were affected by an early and particularly severe flu season. The data in 2020 were severely affected by COVID-19, particularly in weeks 7 to 10 of Term 1. Two data sets are provided for 2020, actual, which includes all weeks of semester one, and adjusted, which excludes weeks 7 to 10 Term 1. If I can just um, by way of background, there's been an agreement at a national level about how we will record um, our data and some debate. I'm quite happy for all of West Australian's data to be out there because it's one of the best uh, in Australia during uh, the, the pandemic. Uh, but there's a debate nationally about what the data looks like that's made public. Um, as the information uh, is provided in tabular form, I seek leave to have this incorporated into Hansard. Members, the Leader of the House seeks leave to incorporate that table into Hansard. Is leave granted? Aye. Aye. Leave is granted. Um, the Honourable Steve Martin. Thank you, President. My question, without notice of which some notice is given, is to the Parliamentary Secretary representing the Minister for Electoral Affairs. I refer to a response given yesterday by the Parliamentary Secretary on behalf of the Minister for Electoral Affairs, the Honourable Jorn Sibmer, regarding electoral reform of the Upper House, in which a reference was made to widely expressed community concern. And I ask, number one, can the Minister advise what consultation process was used to gauge the widespread community concern at the election, res at the election result? Two, over what time period did the consultation take consultation process take place? And three, was the consultation undertaken in regional WA and what percentage of the population in regional WA were concerned? The Parliamentary Secretary to the Attorney General. Thank you, President, and I thank the member for some uh, notice of the question, and I provide the following response on behalf of the Minister for Electoral Affairs. One to three, the March 2020 general election prompted widespread media coverage of the anomalous results in the Legislative Council. The government established the Ministerial Expert Committee, the Committee on Electoral Reform, to review the electoral system for the Legislative Council and provide recommendations. The committee is undertaking a wide consultation with the WA community. It has asked interested members of the public and organisations to make submissions on its terms of reference and there has been considerable interest from the public regarding the review. The committee has received over 50 submissions which it is currently considering. Submissions are open to the public until Tuesday the 8th of June 2021. Information, terms of reference and public submissions can be found on the committee website at waelectoralreform.wa.gov.au. Notice of which some notice has been given is to the Leader of the House representing the Minister for Transport. Uh, I refer to question without notice 1083 asked on the 14th of October 2020 on the PFAS contaminated oil extracted oh, during yeah. tunnelling from the Forestville yeah. Airport link. Yeah. Uh, they're very keen today. Are we finished now? Honourable members. Do you um, need me to start again, Leader of the House, or we I can just continue? I think you've got it. I ask, one, has any of the 600,000 cubic metres of spoil stockpiled at 777 Abernathy Road, Forestfield, now been reused, and if so, where? Two, has any of the 110,000 cubic metres of spoil stockpiled at Perth Airport now been reused, and if so, where? Three, has the estimated 160,000 cubic metres been used on the FAL project as predicted, and from what storage source was this derived? Four, how long can the government store this spoil on temporary storage sites before it is considered a waste? And five, would the same time frame apply to spoil accumulated by a private sector business? 
Leader of the House. Thanks, President. I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. One of the joys now about representing the Minister for Transport is I get to answer the PFAS questions, uh, so I'm delighted to answer my first one. Um, one to two, no. Three, yes, Abernathy Road. Four, the material is not considered waste. Five, not applicable. The Honourable Colin de Grusa. President, my question without notice of which some notice has been given is to the Minister for Agriculture and Food. I refer to the State Barrier Fence Esperance Extension and I ask one, since the completion of the initial 63 kilometres of fence in April 2020, have any additional sections of the fence been constructed? Two, if not, what has been the cause of the delay? Three, have any materials for the construction of the remaining sections of the fence been procured? And if so, how are they stored? Four, can the minister commit to a definitive timeline within which the remainder of the fence will be completed? If not, why not? Minister for Regional Development. I thank the member for the question, and uh, I think he actually probably knows the answer because he has been uh, following the issue for some time. Um, but it is uh, um, the delay um, is caused, or the, uh, our inability to start the remainder of the project is because we are still uh, undertaking the Illua negotiations. Now, I can understand they are taking uh, a long time time. There has been some impact of COVID in that some of the group meetings um, did have to be cancelled. Um, we certainly have looked at um, what other ways we might be uh, able to do this. Uh, I think there's some, uh, the, and I presume the member has been contacted by uh, the farmers on whose property the, um, uh, the fencing is stored. Um, they um, uh, there is a view that 70 per cent of the remainder is on freehold property, and so we should be able to get on with it. Uh, my understanding it's only around 25 per cent of the remainder is on freehold property, uh, and it is um, very, very interspersed. But uh, I've certainly had a, a letter from uh, Mr Neil Wandell talking about uh, whether or not we can look at having some arrangements where those little bits that are there um, can be done. Um, uh, separately while we're trying to resolve uh, the native title for the other areas. Uh, the advice from the department initially is that that would be too expensive, but if we can negotiate something, uh, we're happy to do it. Now, the idea that somehow or other there's a problem with this fencing being out in the weather, uh, it is outside, but you will know, member, that, um, that uh, or, uh, but certainly if you can assure Mr Wandell uh, that this is designed to be out in the weather, right? It's our intention it's going to be out in the weather for many, many, many decades. So I'd hope the fact that it's out in the weather, it's galvanised, um, and certainly from the pictures I've seen, it looks quite bright and shiny, uh, so uh, I'm not quite sure what the cause of concern is. But it, look, it has taken much longer than and table the picture. I'm quite happy to table the photograph of Mr. Wandel if he would like to get into the part. I'd like to get into the hand side. Um, that document is tabled. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, but I just say, oh, look, I, I understand the frustration. Certainly, uh, the Illua negotiations are taking uh, a long time. Uh, the department uh, is very focused on trying to bring those to a resolution, but there are processes that are really outside uh, our control. The Honourable Jorn Sidmar. Uh, my question, without notice, for which some notice is given, is to the minister representing the Minister for Environment. Uh, I refer to the answer the Minister provided me on 25 May concerning the origin of information which was provided in an answer to an earlier question about data relating to the diversion of construction and demolition or C&D waste, and I ask one, does the Minister's answer imply that official statistics derive from self-reporting of the operators themselves, and two, if yes to one, what specific process does the Department of Water and Environmental Regulation currently undertake to validate the integrity of this self-reported information? Uh, the Minister for Mental Health. Thank you, President, and I thank the Honourable Member for some notes to the question. The following answer is provided on behalf of the Minister for Environment. One, recyclers are required to report waste and recycling data annually under Regulation 18C of the Waste Avoidance and Resource Recovery Regulations 2008. Regulation 18D of the regulations requires information to be calculated or estimated in accordance with gazetted procedures approved by the Chief Executive Officer. 
In relation to the waste levy, licensees must make a record under Regulation 17 of the Waste Avoidance and Resource Recovery Regulations, and under, and under Regulation 18, uh, use these records to make a return in the approved form, setting out details of the waste received, and lodge this return with the Chief Executive Officer. Two, an audit program is undertaken each year to verify the integrity of the data reported for a sample of returns. In addition, validation is undertaken for each return. Returns are compared against data reported in the previous year. Returns are also checked against data reported under licence conditions. The, uh, the Leader of the House. I offer business of the House be resumed. The business of the House is resumed. Ministers or parliamentary secretaries, are there any further answers? President, on behalf of the Minister for Housing, I'd like to provide um, an answer for the Honourable uh, Colin de Grusse's question without notice 130 and the Honourable Steve Martin's question without notice 139, asked on the 25th of May, and I seek leave to have them incorporated into Hansard. The Minister seeks leave to have both those answers incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? Aye. Leave is granted. The Minister for Mental Health. President, I would like to provide an answer to the Honourable Donald Farragher's question without notice, 133, which was asked on 25 May 2021, and I seek leave to have the answer incorporated into Hansard. Members, the Minister seeks leave to have that answer incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? Aye. Leave is granted. Minister for Mental Health. President, I would like to provide an answer to the Honourable Brian Walker's question without notice 155, which was asked on 26 May 2021, and I seek leave to have the answer incorporated into Hansard. Members, the Minister seeks leave to have that answer incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? Aye. Leave is granted. Minister for Mental Health. President, I would like to provide an answer to the Honourable Wilson Tucker's question without notice 154, which was asked on 26 May 2021, and I seek leave to have the answer incorporated into Hansard. Members, the Minister seeks leave to have that answer incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? Aye. Leave is granted. President, I would like to provide an answer to the Honourable Colin de Grusse's question without notice 149, which was asked on 26 May 2021, and I seek leave to have the answer incorporated into Hansard. Members, the Minister seeks leave to have that answer incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? Aye. Leave is granted. President, uh, with respect to the Honourable Martin Aldridge's question without, question without notice 156, part 4, which was asked yesterday, uh, I have sought clarification and can inform the Honourable Member that invoices are generally issued after 60 days. Uh, however, some invoices are provided within less than 60 days, where passengers request priority or company invoices. The effort to provide a breakdown of the number by time period would need to be undertaken by a manual process and is not an effective use of WA Health resources. Are there any further uh, answers from ministers or parliamentary secretaries? The Minister for Regional Development. President, I would uh, like to provide a, cor a correction to the Honourable Dr. Steve Thomas's. Qu uh, sorry, I would like to provide a, quest a correction to the answer given to the Honourable Dr. Steve Thomas in his question without notice, Hansard number one two eight. Uh, um, asked on the 25th of May 2021. I would like to correct my response to part three of the question. The amount paid is $71,468. The incorrect figure of $501,779 was provided to the Department of Mines, Industry and Regulation and Safety by QBE. I apologise to the House for the error. Are there any further answers from ministers or parliamentary secretaries? Uh, President, uh, just, the Honourable Peter Collier. Uh, thanks, President. Just with regard to a question that I asked yesterday, and there was the incorrect reference to a question from the Premier, and the Leader of the House was going to follow up. Leader of the House, on a point may. of clarification. Yeah, if I may, I think it was just the two different um, numbers that are used in the Council and in the Hansard, and um, so uh, I will, behind the chair, tell you which one is wrong, but that's what it was. It was just the different numbers that are used in the Legislative Council and that are then used in Hansard. And in answering the question, as I, rec as I recall, the way the answers are provided refers to the Hansard number. But I'll clarify for you that behind the chair. Um, are there any further answers from ministers and parliamentary secretaries? Members, we... Leader of the House. Uh, can I move that we move to member statements? Yes. <laughs> Members, the question is, we now move to member statements. All of the, do we need, we need to take that to Yep. 
Uh, all of those, all those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, say no. The ayes have it. Members, we now have member statements. Are there any President. members with member statements?